Is braking rigged? And is backyard brakes getting all of the loaded boxes? One of us thinks so, and two of us say no way. Let's debate. Hello, sports card investors, and welcome to a juicy episode of Cards on the Table, our fast-paced talk show where we debate topics across the world of sports cards, and there is no juicier topic right now than the allegations that Backyard Breaks is getting loaded cases of Panini products, and somebody is directing those big hits to Backyard Breaks. Is this true? Is this not true? There's a lot of opinions swirling around on social media right now, and we've got a lot of opinions on our own. Teapot, welcome to the show. Ben, welcome to the show. You guys ready to talk about this? Yeah. You smell something? It's, uh, something smells funny. Oh, boy. Oh, my God. Oh, boy. Now, guys, this all started about, about a week ago on Twitter. The collectibles guru, Eric Whiteback, on Twitter put out a post, and he said, Something may be fishy here. What are the odds that Backyard Breaks, one breaking company, pulled the flawless LeBron triple logo man, the flawless Warriors triple logo man, the Prism Cade Black one of one, and the National Treasures Cade logo man one of one, four of the biggest hits in recent memory, all from one breaking company. He did a bunch of math. Some of it contains a lot of unknowns. We're going to talk about that. But his conclusion was that it could be, it could be as unlikely as one in 117,605. That's how long the odds could potentially be that they pulled those four hit cards. Now, what is interesting is that about a month ago, Teapot, you came to me here at Sports Card Investor, and Teapot said, Jeff, I think something odd is going on with Backyard Breaks. And he had done his own math, his own analysis. He showed it to me. I wasn't sold on it, to be quite honest, so we didn't put anything out about it. But now, of course, Teapot is waving the I told you so flag now that Eric Whiteback has said the same. Uh, Teapot, take us through your thinking on this, right, and why you think Backyard Breaks could very well be getting loaded cases. Yeah, a lot of assumptions being made in the numbers and the cases and everything. What Eric did that I thought was smart is he tried to figure out how much money they would be spending in order to get to that, what he said would be like a half percent probability if they were spending $40 million on these products. He's trying to kind of quantify it to make the numbers more accessible. The problem is he made a lot of assumptions that people then sort of started poking holes in and saying, well, you can't do that. So here's what I want to do. I want to ask each of you, do you think it's highly probable, probable, improbable, or highly improbable that they would hit those four big product hits that you mentioned? I mean, I think it's highly improbable, but still possible and not indicative of a funny business, which okay. I'm going to explain why. But I will go highly improbable. So how much, if you guys had to guess, and you'll have to collaborate on this, what percentage of Flawless do you think that Backyard Breaks ripped? I know they are by far the number one breaker when it comes to ripping the really high end yeah, boxes. Yep. They've got some big whale customers yep. who, you know, go through a crazy yeah, amount. Yeah. We've heard twice as much as maybe any other breaker, so. Yeah. Um, I, maybe, I don't 50%, that might be on the high side, 40%, something of that nature. I would almost assume that the floor would be around like 20. I'm going to put in 40% into my calculator sure, here. Fair. NT, do you think they ripped as much? There's more NT that's not hand packed product like Flawless. I'd imagine they ripped less, but what do you guys think? 30%? 30? Yeah, something Feel like that. Feel good about that? Okay. Yeah. Now, Prism's the sticky one. Hitting the Cade Black one of one, the true black one of one, and they hit it on day one out of first off the line. That's the one that seems to me to be the, the biggest long shot because there's so much Prism. What percentage of Prism do you think that they would, they would rip in total? Probably lower 10%, maybe. Yeah, I'd say even lower than that. But does it matter that it was first off the line? Not, t not necessarily because the black can be in any product. Mm. Okay. So the, the, either way. So I, I said 5%. Let's, let's be generous and go to 10%. Now, here's what I did. I'm going to expand this. What this is showing you is this is showing you the probability of them hitting one product hit. So if you were to stratify the four biggest 
you know, hits in the product from one to four. In the case of NT, you're talking like Jalen Green, Cade Cunningham, Evan Mobley, Scotty Barnes, right, going down the list. So here's the odds of them hitting. If they open 40% of the product, they have a 40% chance of hitting the biggest card in the product. Compounding odds, you do 40% times 40% to say they have a 16% chance of hitting, getting two, all the way down to a 2.56% chance if they open 40% of Flawless of hitting all four of those biggest cards out of Flawless, whatever they are, it doesn't even matter. And the same thing for each of these products. So what I did here, based on your math, this is the probability that they hit the four cards they hit. The two biggest cards out of Flawless, the biggest card out of NT, and the biggest card out of Prism is about a half percent chance, based on 40%, 30%, 10%. That just seems like long odds to me. Now, if they rip less than this, the numbers obviously right. get much, much, much lower. They only lower. rip 20% of Flawless yeah. or 10% yeah. of NT or something and like that. Percent, we made pretty big assumptions. Half percent is possible. Yeah. It's definitely possible. But it is, for me, it raises an alarm bell. Yep. And, and a month and a half ago, or whenever I did the analysis, I didn't think they were ripping quite this much. In fact, I'm pretty convinced they'd be ripping less prism than that. Mm -hmm. But they might if, be. You, if you lay it out even, even simpler without these assumptions, and just said if they were ripping 25% of each, 50% of each product, 75% or 90% of every mm -hmm. product, here's your odds. Even if they were opening 90% of each of these products, they still only have a two-thirds chance of hitting those four cards. So the odds are really long. People talked about Leighton hitting you know, the two big cards in 2018 for Luca. Uh, that's two cards, not four cards. Every time you hit a product hit, that's where things get a lot longer. So I'll kind of stop there and let you, you know, kind of weigh in on this. I know you have thoughts on this, but I, I think the stats to me just make me go, whoa, this is, ooh, I don't know. The, those, are, those are long odds, I give that to you. But, but part of my fundamental problem with how these stats have been calculated, the ones that you've done here, as well as the ones that Eric Whiteback have done in other analysis that I have seen is everybody is starting with the end result. This, in my opinion, is the Texas sharpshooter bias. This is a statistical fallacy. And what it is, is you look at a barn where there's shots all over the side of the barn by a guy shooting, and it happens that four of those shots are right next to each other. So then he goes up to the barn and he draws a target around those four shots. And he goes, look, I'm four for four and hitting the bullseye. Okay, because you, you looked at the results and then you drew the circle. That's not proper statistical analysis. You have to start with a theory at the beginning. You have to, you have to create a hypothesis and then work your way all through the data. <clears throat> and this, this, while I grant you, if your hypothesis was, what are the chances they would pull the two biggest hits out of Flawless and the biggest hit out of NT and whatever, you would come down to this conclusion. But it's ignoring other major product releases the same year it's ignore i mean even the lo the uh lamella logo man which different year of nt yeah. pulled by somebody mm -hmm. else the other day it's it's ignoring it's ignoring a lot of things um i got to give you a real world example here i got a, I, I had sent I, I got two redemption cards from 2018 immaculate for the luca trey yep. double on card signature card number to 49 i sent them in a panini I got back from Panini the 1 of 49 and the 49 of 49. Back from Panini, right? Totally rigged. What, it, the odds, and those are likely the two best cards. You could say, well, maybe a jersey number, but since there's two players on the card, the jersey number isn't yeah. as applicable. So I think it's the 1 of 49 and the 49 of 49 are the two that you would want. They're the most valuable. It's a 0.04% chance that I would get those two back from Panini, a 1 of 49 and a 49 of 49. That's actually even longer odds than what we're talking about here, but I got them back. And for everybody who's going to say, well, Panini sent Jeff the best cards, that was rigged too. I had sent in a bunch of redemptions all at the same time. All the other redemptions that I got back, none of them were 1 of 49, 49 of 49 jerseys. It just so happened these two were. It was a random occurrence, but, but, if I want to do, you know, if I want to draw a circle around it and work backwards yeah. from it, it looks impossibly long. I also think that there's a lot of questions about the math where we don't know the answers. There's assumptions being made about print runs. We're not paying attention to how quickly or as you, or how late into the product they hit the card. We have no idea how they actually got any of these boxes and how many of these boxes were still unripped at the time they ripped it and actually pulled out the particular card. In the case of the of the LeBron Triple Logo Man, that was hit after 
probably 70 or 80 percent of all the boxes had already been ripped. Yeah. I mean, there was a huge number of boxes that had been ripped. The Warriors was after that, too. And the Warriors was, was after, after that. that yeah. So it's possible that actually they, at that moment in time, were opening up 75% of all available flawless boxes of the ones left on the market at that point. There's a lot of questions here about the math. And, and you know, I wish we had more definitive answers. I wish we knew the print runs. Yeah. I wish we knew how much they get. But in the absence of statistical certainty, you then have to look at other forms of evidence. And in my opinion, all of the anecdotal evidence says this is not true. And I point to things like, Many major breakers have come out and said yep. this, this theory holds no water. Mojo Break, Layden, Blaise, Clubhouse Breaks have all released, have all said, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't hold water. Additionally, I've been told by people with knowledge of how these products are made that the printing company, Prism in particular, is 100% machine sorted and there's no ability to mess with the product. No one has the ability to do it. Flawless is hand-packed, so there's a little bit more of a chance, but no Panini employees allowed in the facility. Um, it's a third-party printing company. They do this for right. security yeah. purposes. And Backyard Breaks does not get any of their product direct from Panini. They get it all through third-party distributors. So it goes from the, uh, from the uh, facility to third-party distributors, and then in some cases, they're also buying it from other dealers on the secondary market. And if there was some conspiracy, the only way I could see this happening, and it's possible, is that there's a rogue employee at the print, at the print house that's doing something. That is how the McDonald's game was rigged back in the 1990s, Boardwalk and Park Place. That was rigged. Yep. That could be happening. But if that's going to happen, why would the guy at the printing facility not give it to a friend or not Keep it on his well, own or not. You, you can't just have the LeBron show up mysteriously to some guy. I mean, that would probably raise, I guess, I guess in theory, but you'd want to see it. Somebody needs to know, oh, you bought that case. Like, to me, if you're, in the, if you're in the warehouse and somebody says, hey, I'll give you 50K, you're making 50 or 40K a year to work here, I'll give you 50K if you slap a little RFID sticker that I can track this case around and figure out where it's going and buy into it. I, I, I don't want to get too much into causation. To that Solve our debate here, yeah. Ben. Solve our debate. So, Jeff, I'll, I'll mostly agree with you. As much as I want to be able to dunk on you for all the Syracuse strays I catch um, on this show from time to time, I have to agree with you. A lot of it has to do with the math. We, the, the problem with your math teapot is it doesn't take into consideration that, yeah, it's not like flawless and national treasures are all just going to be dumped off of a truck somewhere all at the same time. We might only have 20% of that product coming out initially, and there's a very real chance that even if Backyard Breaks is only opening 5, 10, 20% of something, in that specific moment, they might be opening 70% of it. That absolutely has to be taken into consideration. And then we look at the distribution model. They're not direct from Panini, even if they were. We're talking about multiple steps that this has to go through. You have to have somebody with Panini, like you said, putting a sticker on there. Then it has to go through the distribution. Then it actually has to get to Backyard Breaks. And then I also think, the logic around why this would even happen should, should be taken into consideration. I know you've avoided it, but we should be thinking about that because the, the realistic situation we have is there's like seven pieces of anecdotal evidence why this isn't happening, and then there's the, the core argument is built around it seems unlikely, no. right? That's, that's the only evidence that we have. No one has said, I think this is legitimately happening. Nobody at Panini. No yeah. one at these distributors. Panini, yeah. Panini wouldn't want this to happen. Yeah. No, no, no I, it, it I would... don't think Panini would want no. this to happen. I don't think Whatnot would want this to happen. You, you, you like the casinos, Jeff. Blackjack, poker. Mm -hmm. If somebody goes in and they crush the house four days in a row, security is going to be all over them. Sure. They're going to be monitoring sure. them. And that's, that's what I'm saying. It, once you get to a point of improbability... Yeah. Something deserves to be investigated potentially. I agree with that. Here's why I don't think it's a sharpshooter fallacy because you could you could right now say let's go into the year 2023 and take these same four products and say what are the four product hits? What are the odds? I'm not I'm not picking random cards like a black gold and a this and an mm -hmm. RPA to 25 and going gee look they hit a bunch of big cards something doesn't smell right they rip a ton of product more than anybody else. I'm saying the odds of hitting these four cards are highly improbable. I didn't cherry pick different things. The reason I don't think the diminishing odds is because this is sort of like the coin flip analogy. I can say right now what the percentage odds are of hitting tails 10 times in a row. Now, every individual flip 
is back to 50%. So as you, as you have that diminishing probability, yes, it's gonna go up. But there was no guarantee that that card wasn't gonna come out on day one, the LeBron Triple Logo Man, because the Cade came out on mm -hmm. day one. So you have to look at the product as a whole. Now, put a bow on all this, I know our time is up. I did wanna go through some important premises quickly. Let's do it. The assumptions that I made, product hits from those four or three products, Prism Flawless, NT, okay? We're not concerned about the lesser hits because of the reasons I just said. We're not trying, I'm not at this point trying to do causation. And the reason why, or motive, is because we don't have access to the right data. I think it would be fun, and I've heard others doing it, speculating on how do they track it and whatever. But you can't say that that's enough to go shut up to the statistics. That's, that's where we start getting into a different fallacy, which is this personal incredulity fallacy that, well, there's, this is too complicated, so it po can't possibly be real. That's, that's definitely not the case. And it, this has nothing to do with any personal liking or disliking for backyard mm -hmm. breaks. A lot of comments around that, a lot of emotions, people patroning them and people who don't like their style, whatever. And again, like I said, that diminishing supply thing, that, that does not hold water to me. If you would have said, what is Backyard Break's odds of hitting the LeBron Triple Logo Man the day they hit it? Sure. Much, much higher. Yeah. But they had already ripped a crap ton of the products. So you can't, you have to say, you have to factor that into what they were doing to say, here's what their odds were. So that's what I'm, yeah. I'm trying to be objective about analyzing the stats. I disagree with that because they were still buying product at that moment. So as every, as product was being ripped, then they were going out and buying more yeah. on the secondary market. So it's like every time they made a purchase of more wax, their odds of hitting the LeBron yeah. triple logo man were going that up That means and every, up. every time you open that you couldn't do a, a, uh, a statistical probability prior to ripping anything because nothing's been ripped, but you can. You can look at it and say, here's all the product, here's how much they're going to rip, what are their chances of hitting? One, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. It's an interesting conversation. I, it, we're, we're, we're way over time, but we had to, it was obviously a lot of spirit, so much spirit, by the way, that we actually knocked our TV out for part of that, but it's back online now. Look at that nice little logo back there. Uh, I'm just gonna wrap, and we got more topics to talk about, but I'm just gonna wrap by saying this. First of all, even though I don't think this is going on, I, I do think there should be an investigation because breaking has to be fair. Yeah. Allocation has to be random. The chances of getting one of these big hits mm -hmm. has to be equally shared by everybody who opens yeah. a box. Transparency in the process, packing, distribution. So Panini yeah. does need yeah. to do an investigation. This More of this data needs to come to light. Even though I don't think it's happening, it's the best thing for the hobby for this to be as transparent as possible. There cannot be any shenanigans. It is possible that you do have some rogue thing going on, and if, if that is happening, it needs to be outed right it away. Wouldn't be it wouldn't There's be the first time. It wouldn't be the first time. a lot of money at stake. It wouldn't be the first time. Yeah. I agree. I don't think it's happening, but it wouldn't be the first time. What did you think of Backyard Break's response to this whole thing? I, well, I, I love that they leaned into it. Yeah. What else are you supposed to do? I mean... In I, a very sarcastic yeah, way. Yeah, very, very but sarcastic But I mean, that fits way. their style. Yeah, I mean... I, thought, I honestly thought it was a, a brilliant response by them. Not the response that I would have given, but a brilliant response by them. I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I understand. Um, wow. That was, that was a lot, guys. Of course, cannot wait to hear what you think of all of this analysis. Everything we just dumped on you, let us know in the comments below. I cannot wait to read the comments on this episode. This is going to be fun. But we've got a couple of other great topics to cover today. We're cutting it down to only two other topics since we gave so much extra time to that one. But, I, but the first of these two goes back to the, the video that you did, the Data Dive video you did on the Market Movers YouTube channel this past weekend. Should you buy, sell, or hold cards during the playoffs? Yeah. You specifically looked at MLB, and then you looked at some other sports. You used Market Movers to dive into the data. Yeah. What did you find? So I like to look at these uh, kind of recurring questions, right? Because there's always timing. There's the seasonality cycle, you know, cycles in the year. And so I go back to it to see, does the pattern still hold true? And what I did was I started with the NHL index from last year and said, how did that do from the end of the NHL season until now? And it was down way more sure. than the SCI 500 and other indexes that I compared it to. So what I did is I put together an MLB playoff index and I took two players from every team going into the playoffs, their two best players, mm -hmm. and I put their cards in here, tried to keep them of equal value roughly and I want to track how it performs. And this is how it, how it performs so far. We're in the last, basically since October 7, we're looking at this. This baseball index is already down 6.5%. SCI 500 down 1.6% 1, 1. in that time frame, tracking really with the stock market and everything. But baseball's already down 65 Now, if I scroll down to the cards, 
no surprise here, Jordan Alvarez. Sure. Up 62%. He's the one. Bryce Harper, yep. up 44%. Yep. Shane yep. Bieber, up 25%. Yep. And then Arenado up. I don't know that's surprising. Freddie Freeman was up. He had a great series, even though they got knocked out. And, then and that may just not down. be enough time yet. We may see Freddie Freeman stuff drop. It will. You know, Arenado stuff I mean, drop I here in the upcoming guarantee. weeks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jared Kelnick, he's down 44%. He had this little run-up from getting called up, and they got bounced. Aaron Judge, down 43%. And actually, he's down more than that from his high point in the last two weeks. That's his Topps Chrome base card, PSA 10. And he's just, it went up so high that he's coming. He's not having a great Every, series. Everyone, They're booing everyone, him. Yeah, everyone. And Yankees fans, come on. Everyone, come everyone. On. You know. Buy, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. So, this, this data does not surprise me. Yeah. And, if you, and you see this in other sports. I remember last football season, you had one real winner during the playoffs. That was Joe Burrow. Maybe Jamar Chase a little bit, but Burrow's cards went 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 yep. crazy. Yep. But then they then they came down after uh, yep. they didn't you know uh, do as well in the Super Bowl. Or it was close, obviously, but they didn't win the Super Bowl. Uh, but you but so so much carnage everywhere else yep. when teams are eliminated. Yep. Carnage occurs yep. with yep. card I mean, prices. This is big carnage yeah. in a ten day period. Yeah, in a very like, short period yeah, of time. Like, yeah, it's going to look way worse in yep. another couple of weeks. Yeah. Are you when 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 is the best time in your opinion to sell? Yeah, so the way that I look at, at this is, one, I don't buy during the season for these specific players. Yeah. So during baseball season, I'm not buying at all. I do all of that during the off season. When I think about buying baseball, coming up after the playoffs, that's when I actually am going to think about doing this. And when I think about selling, it's before the playoffs. Once these teams are determined that they're going to be in the postseason, that's when I'm targeting it because I want to remove as much of the results as possible. Yeah. I want to, we, we look at somebody like Judge, who he's not a great example because he was so popular this season, but he comes out and strikes out, what, like eight times out of 10 at bats or something like that. I want to remove those results completely. And I'd realistically like to sell maybe one or two games early mm. and come out maybe like 40 or 50% on top, yeah. then risk selling too late. And that's what you have to avoid. Again, I completely... Yeah, but baseball is intense. 162 exactly. game season. Exactly. Down to a handful of games to where we have the two like wild card teams in the NLCS. Like this is, yeah, it's a it's a different ball game. It's really you really got to sell during that hype factor for yes. sure because that's when the cards are are going up, not when the actual events are, are occurring. Off and it's the hype leading up to the events that are really driving prices. Yeah. Interesting, interesting stuff. And of course. Uh, Market Movers X is the home of all these Market Pulse indexes and everything like that. You guys know you can now subscribe to Market Movers X for as little as $9.99 by going to sportscardinvestor.com, clicking on Market Movers in the main menu bar. Or if you just want a little bit of free data to get started with, then this is your best friend. that sports card investor app free in the app store just go to the app store on your phone and search for sports card investor okay guys we're only doing one mailbag topic today since we spend so much time on the earlier topics but this one is around 80s and 90s cards there was a commenter on our last episode that said why don't we talk more about 80s and 90s cards we're talking about a lot of ultra modern and we talk about vintage and it is true that we haven't spent as much time talking about 80s and 90s cards on this channel which is probably a miss because all of us grew up in the in the 80s, in the 90s. So 90s are eras for you, 80s more of the era for me. But those cards are still near and dear to our heart. Ben, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Talk to me about 80s and 90s cards, and and is is that still in, are they investable? Are they worth talking about at this point? What stands out to you from those eras? Yeah, so I think in general we talk about 80s and 90s cards less than ultra modern and vintage because of the whole junk wax era. That makes sense. But there's a way to be thoughtful mm -hmm. about what is actually investable during that period of time. And I think we're all going to align on this. And it's uh, short printed, low pop, high graded, uh, case hit style inserts. I think big men on court, rave reviews, noise boys, uh, dunk and go nuts. We could go on basically forever. Those cards are absolutely investable. 
If you can get Jordan in any of those cards, absolutely do it. He's going to be a little pricier. But this is also a golden age because there's guys like Iverson, Kobe, yep. Shaq. There's yep. a whole list of guys. Vince Carter. There's tons of these Hall of Fame level players in really low print run inserts. Again, big men on my or, uh, big men on court. One of my favorite inserts. I yep. think it's one out of 240 yep. uh, pack odds in, in uh, Skybox Z Force. Uh, the other series had Slam Cam, another favorite of mine. There's absolutely opportunities if you're thoughtful enough. But unfortunately, a lot of these cards, stuff like Big Men on Court, they're die cuts. It's going to be hard to find mm -hmm. them in high grades. Uh, Slam Cam is very condition sensitive. There's a little bit of foil on it. Very hard to find in high grades. And I, Teapot is just like yeah. waiting to get into this. this I, I can already see the screen. He, I, he and I are aligned very much on this that... That's like the golden age of inserts. The 80s and 90s stuff, absolutely love to collect it. Very investable, but you have to be thoughtful about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. this is the, the 90s stuff yeah. especially for you, so, right? So if I were to open four boxes of cards and pull four, one in 144 oh packs, what are the <laughs> oh odds gosh. would you guys say of me <laughs> oh boy. hitting that? No, I love the 90s. I love the 90s. 80s, eh, I could leave that behind except, yeah. except for the importance of those rookie cards and things. But the 90s, especially like 95 and onward, when the insert game changed, when the parallels. I just love going back to price movements and pulling up a set to see the eye candy and yeah. look at, mm -hmm. this is 98 Skybox Premium. This is Market Movers this is, X again, This is one obviously. of my favorite products, maybe my favorite product of the 90s. I, it's just, the inserts are amazing. Intimidation Nation, you got the uh, Star Rubies, you got the 3D, which are like this early cracked ice effect, Soul of the Game. These are ones, I will tell you, the soul of the game that you have to see in hand. They just don't look as good in a picture, mm -hmm. uh, but they're really sharp. And you can just kind of see it. Here you get with the Jordan, a much mm -hmm. better uh, you know, visual effect of that card. This is it. I mean, get lost in the 90s. If you grew up with it, if you didn't, there's so much to explore. If you had a favorite team then, there were a lot of good players. And one of the things I really like about this is, obviously Jordan and Kobe and a handful of others are gonna be very investable. If you're just having fun, you just wanna collect, and you had a team in the 90s, Grant Hill like was your favorite player, Penny Hardaway, even lesser guys, you can get a lot of these really, really cool cards for not a ton of money. You can build a pretty cool mm -hmm. collection and have a lot of fun, very visually compelling and unique stuff. I love the 90s. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy we have so many of these in Market Movers X. It's, you can see them all visually right there. So I'm, I'm 80s, and the only thing I'll say about 80s, because we didn't have these cool inserts, we didn't have numbered cards, we didn't have any of that, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have chrome cards, we didn't have any of that stuff in the 80s. So the, the way that I'm collecting that era today is on-card autographs. Yeah. So I've been going back to the 80s, Bo Jackson, you know, 86 tops traded, rookie card, on-card autograph. You know, if you can get those in a high grade, if you can get those, you know, a PSA 10, auto 10 type thing, they can be extremely low population, you know, populations under 50 yeah. on those types of cards. That's the way that I take a very overprinted era and make it unique and more collectible in my opinion. Yeah. Guys, this was a great show. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it as well. If you did, please subscribe if you haven't yet and hit that like button. We really appreciate that. And of course, go check out the new Market Movers X by going to sportscardinvestor.com, click on Market Movers X in the main menu bar and download the Sports Card Investor app on your phone. We appreciate you guys watching. See you soon with our next episode. Take care.